Thank you, Mr. Jake, Professor Jake, for doing this uh, class number five for us on uh, Travis and Charlie. So we'll, uh, we'll get we'll get right into it. I'm going to go ahead and, and mute us, um, and but I will unmute us if there are questions. You know, I'll just leave us unmuted. I'm feeling wishy-washy today. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, I am in Richmond, Virginia. You are over on the West Coast, so. Uh, a little earlier where you are. <clears throat> so in my book, which is the 25th anniversary edition, we are on page 66. And uh, which means that we're about almost a third of the way through the book, which is right on target because we're at class number five. And so this, this is uh, the next section I labeled um, rest stops and truckers. <clears throat> and it's an interesting section for me because my grandfather was a trucker for Navajo trucking. And so he would always tell me different stories about uh, being a truck driver. So um, this kind of confirms a lot of things that he told me. So uh, here we go on Travels with Charlie. From the beginning of my journey, I had avoided the great high speed splashes of concrete and tar called throughways or superhighways. Various states have different names for them, but I had dawdled in New England. The winter grew apace, and I had visions of being snowbound in North Dakota. I sought out US 90, a wide gash of a superhighway, multiple lane carrier of the nation's goods. Rosinante bucketed along. The minimum speed on this road was greater than any I had previously driven. I drove into a wind quartering in from my starboard bow and felt the buffeting, sometimes staggering blows of the gale I helped to make. I could hear the soft of it on the square surfaces of my camper top. Instructions screamed at me from the road once, do not stop, no stopping, maintain speed. Trucks as long as freighters went roaring by, delivering a wind like the blow of a fist. These great roads are wonderful for moving goods, but not for inspection of a countryside. You are bound to the wheel and your eyes to the car ahead and to the rear view mirror for the car behind and the side mirror for the car or truck about to pass. And at the same time, you must read all the signs for fear you may miss some instructions or orders. No roadside stands selling squash juice. Uh, you know, I've read this book like 50 times in my life, and I always get a kick out of that. I've never seen squash juice in my life, and I've traveled across country like 12 times, but Steinbeck says he had squash juice. It could be that he made that up, though. I don't know. But anyway, if any of you have ever had squash juice, feel free to raise your hand. And he says, when we no roadside stand scaling, squash juice, no antique stores, no farm products or factory outlets. When we get these throughways across the whole country, as we will and must, it will be possible to drive from New York to California without seeing a single thing. At intervals, there are places of rest and recreation, food, fuel, and oil, postcards, steam table food picnic tables, garbage cans, all fresh and newly painted, restrooms and laboratories so spotless, so incensed with deodorants and with detergents that it takes a time to get your sense of smell back. For deodorants are not quite correctly named, they substitute one smell for another, and the substitute must be much stronger and more penetrating than the odor that it conquers. So again, this is uh, you know Steinbeck, uh, the deodorant expert. I love how he goes off on these little tangents, but anyway, that's interesting. It doesn't mask, you know, it masks it by a different odor. So it's not deodorant because it's just another odor becoming more pungent. I had neglected my own country too long. Civilization had made great strides in my absence. I remember when a coin in a slot would get you a stick of gum or a candy bar. But in these dining palaces where vending machines where various coins could deliver handkerchiefs, comb and nail file sets, hair conditioners and cosmetics, first aid kits, minor drugs such as aspirin, mild physics. So this is another thing. Um, 
my students are always like, what do you mean physics? How do they get physics out of a, out of a vending machine? But he means something else by the word physics. Pills to keep you awake. I found myself entranced with these gadgets. Suppose you want a soft drink. You pick your kind, sun grape or a coolie cola, press a button, insert the coin and stand back. A paper cup drops into place. The drink pours out and stops a quarter of an inch from the brim. A cold, refreshing drink, guaranteed synthetic. <laughs> Coffee is even more interesting. For when the hot black fluid has ceased, a squirt of milk comes down and an envelope of sugar drops beside the cup. But of all things, the hot soup machine is the triumph. Choose among 10, pea, chicken noodle, beef and veg, insert the coin. A rumbling hum comes from the giant and a sign lights up that reads, heating. After a minute, a red light flashes on and off until you open a little door and remove the paper cup of boiling hot soup. It is life at a peak of some kind of civilization. <laughs> the restaurant accommodations, great scallops of counters with simulated leather stools are as spotless as and not unlike the laboratories. Everything that can be, can, can be captured and held down is sealed in clear plastic. The food is oven fresh, spotless and tasteless, untouched by human hands. I remembered with an ache certain dishes in France and Italy touched by innumerable human hands. These centers for rest, food and replenishment are kept beautiful with lawns and flowers. And at the front nearest the highway are parking places for passenger automobiles together with regiments of gasoline pumps. At the rear, the trucks draw up and there they have their services, the huge overland caravans. Being technically a truck, Rosinante took her place in the rear and I soon made acquaintance with the truckers. They are a breed set apart from the life around them, the long distance truckers. In some town or city somewhere their wives and children live while the husbands traverse the nation carrying every kind of food, and product and machine. They are clannish and they stick together speaking a specialized language. And although I was a small craft among monsters of transportation, they were kind to me and helpful. I learned that in truck parks, there are showers and soap and towels and that I could park and sleep the night if I wished. The men had little commerce with local people, but being avid radio listeners, they could report news and politics from all parts of the nation. The food and fuel centers on the parkways or throughways are leased by the various states, but on other highways, private enterprise has trucker stations that offer discounts on fuel, beds, baths, and places to sit and shoot the breeze. But being a specialized group leading special lives, associating only with their own kind, they would have made it possible for me to cross the country without talking to a local town bound man. For the truckers cruise over the surface of the nation without being a part of it. Of course, in the towns where their families live, they have whatever routes are possible, clubs, dances, love affairs, and murders. I liked the truckers very much as I always liked specialists. By listening to them talk, I accumulated a vocabulary of the road, of tires and springs, of overweight. The truckers over long distances have stations along their routes where they know the servicemen and the waitresses behind the counters, and where occasionally they meet their, opposite, their opposite numbers in other trucks. The great get-together symbol is the cup of coffee, and I found I stopped for coffee not because I wanted it, but for a rest and a change from the unrolling highway. It takes strength and control and attention to drive a truck long distances, no matter how much the effort is made easier by air brakes and power assisted steering. It would be interesting to know and easy to establish with modern testing methods, how much energy and foot pounds is expended in driving a truck for six hours. Once Ed Ricketts and I collecting marine animals, turning over rocks in an area, tried to estimate how much weight we lifted in an average collecting day. And this is, uh, he's talking about 
Um, this time he did this classification of marine animals with Ed Ricketts, and that book is called, uh, I believe it's called The Sea of Cortez. Um, but anyway, Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts actually found um, new kinds of like sea animals and mollusks and all sorts of things. So he was pretty famous in that area as well. Um, he says, we estimated that on a rich day when we had little sense of energy expended, each of us had lifted four to 10 tons of rock. Consider then the small unnoticed turning of the steering wheel, perhaps the exertion of only one pound for each motion, the varying pressure of foot on accelerator, not more than half a pound perhaps, but an enormous total over a period of six hours. Then there are the muscles of shoulders and neck constantly if unconsciously flexed for emergency, the eyes darting from road to rear view mirror, the thousand decisions so deep that the conscious mind is not aware of them. The output of energy, nervous and muscular is enormous. Thus the coffee break is a rest in many senses. If any of you have ever um, had to rent a U-Haul truck, like my wife and I have done several times over the past six years to move your stuff cross country, towing your car, that's like a really, really long truck. And uh, I did it, and I think I drove seven consecutive days for nine to 10 hours a day. Um, and yeah, by the time you get there, your muscle, your, your shoulder and your back are, are pretty, pretty stressed. Quite often I sat with these men and listened to their talk and now and then asked questions. I soon learned not to expect knowledge of the country they passed through. Except for the truck stops, they had no contact with it. It was driven home to me how like sailors they were. I remember when I first went to sea being astonished that the men who sailed over the world and touched the ports to the strange and exotic had little contact with that world. Some of the truckers on long hauls traveled in pairs and took their turns. The one off duty slept or read paperbacks, but on the roads, their interests were engines and weather and maintaining the speed that makes a predictable schedule possible. Some of them were on regular runs back and forth while others moved over single operations. It is a whole pattern of life, little known to the settled people along the routes of the great trucks. I learned only enough about these men to be sure that I would like to know much more. If one has driven a car over many years as I, as I have, nearly all reactions have become automatic. One does not think about what they do. Nearly all the driving technique is deeply buried in a machine-like unconscious. This being so, a large area of the conscious mind is left free for thinking. And what do people think of when they drive? On short trips, perhaps of arrival at a destination or memory of events at the place of departure. But there is left, particularly on very long trips, a large area for daydreaming or even, God help us, for thought. No one can know what another does in that area. I myself have planned houses I will never build, have made gardens I will never plant, have designed a method for pumping the soft silt and decayed shells from the bottom of my bay up to my point of land at Sag Harbor, of leaching out the salt, thus, thus make, making a rich and productive soil. I don't know whether or not I will do this, but driving along I have planned it in detail, even to the kind of pump the leaching bins, the test to determine disappearance of salinity. Driving, I have created turtle traps in my mind, have written long detailed letters, letters never to be put to paper, much less sent. And when the radio was on, music has stimulated memory of times and places, complete with characters and stage sets, memories so exact that every word of dialogue is recreated. And I have projected future scenes just as complete and convincing, scenes that will never take place. I've written short stories in my mind, chuckling at my own humor, saddened or stimulated by structure or content. I can only suspect that the lonely man peoples his driving dreams with friends, that the loveless man surrounds himself with lovely, loving women, and that children climb through the dreaming of the childless driver. And how about the areas of regrets? If only I had done so-and-so or had not said such-and-such, my God, the damn thing might not have happened. 
Finding this potential in my own mind, I can suspect it in others, but I will never know for no one ever tells. And this is why on my journey, which was designed for observation, I stayed as much as possible on secondary roads where there was much to see and hear and smell and avoided the great wide traffic slashes which promote the self by fostering daydreams. I drove this wide eventless way called US 90, which bypassed Buffalo and Erie to Madison, Ohio, and then found the equally wide and fast US 20 past Cleveland and Toledo, and so into Michigan. All right, so we've now gotten to Michigan from, he started out in Long Island. We've made it all the way to Michigan. And once again, he's um, kind of taken a few asides there to tell us about the trucking culture, but also um, once again, to telling us basically how much more he prefers the side roads uh, to the highways because they don't really allow you to see anything about America. On these roads out of the manufacturing centers, there moved many mobile homes pulled by specially designed trucks. And since these mobile homes comprise one of my generalities, I may as well get to them now. Early in my travels, I had become aware of these new things under the sun, of their great numbers. And since they occur in increasing numbers all over the nation, observation of them and perhaps some speculation is in order. They are not trailers to be pulled by one's own car, but shining cars long as Pullman's. From the beginning of my travels, I had noticed the sale lots where they were sold and traded. But then I began to be aware of the parks where they sit down in uneasy permanence. In Maine, I took to stopping the night in these parks, talking to the managers and to the dwellers in this new kind of housing, for they gather in groups of like to like. They are wonderfully built homes, aluminum skins, double walled with insulation, and often paneled with veneer of hard wood. Sometimes as much as 40 feet long, they have two to five rooms and are complete with air conditioners, toilets, baths, and invariably television. The parks where they sit are sometimes landscaped and equipped with every facility. And I talked with park men who were enthusiastic. A mobile home is drawn to the trailer park and installed on a ramp. A heavy rubber sewer pipe is bolted underneath, water and electric power connected, a television antenna raised, and the family is in residence. Several park managers agreed that last year, one in four new housing units in the whole country was a mobile home. The park men charge a small ground rent plus fees for water and electricity. Telephones are connected in nearly all of them simply by plugging in a jack. Sometimes the park has a general store for supplies, but if not, the supermarkets, which dot the countryside, are available. Parking difficulties in the towns have caused these markets to move to the open country where they're immune from town taxes. And that was exactly uh, when I was in undergraduate school, I did a report on Walmart um, because they, they took over so many of the kind of little mom and pop stores. And that's exactly the Walmart plan. They would move out to a place where they didn't have to pay taxes, pay people very little, and then sell cheap items mostly made from China. And that's how they kind of took over the United States. Sometimes their owners stay for years in one place, plant gardens, build little walls of cinder blocks, put out awnings and garden furniture. It is a whole way of life that was new to me. But these homes are never cheap and are often quite expensive and lavish. I have seen some that cost $20,000 and contained all the thousands of appliances we live by. $20,000 won't get you a cardboard box in Seattle. Dishwashers, automatic clothes washers and dryers, refrigerators, and deep freezes. The owners were not only willing, but glad and proud to show their homes to me. The rooms, while small, were well proportioned. Every conceivable unit was built in. Wide windows, some even called picture windows, destroyed any sense of being closed in. The bedrooms and beds were spacious, and the storage space unbelievable. It seemed to me a revolution in living and on a rapid increase. 
Why did a family choose to live in such a home? Well, it was comfortable, compact, easy to keep clean, and easy to heat. In Maine, I heard, I'm tired of living in a cold barn with the wind whistling through, tired of the torment of little taxes and payments for this and that. It's warm and cozy, and in the summer, the air conditioner keeps us cool. What is the usual income bracket of the mobile home people? That is variable, but a goodly number are in the $10,000 to $20,000 class. Has job uncertainty anything to do with the rapid increase of these units? Well, perhaps there may be some of that. Who knows what is in store tomorrow? Mechanics, plant engineers, architects, accountants, and even here and there, a doctor or a dentist live in the mobile. If a plant or a factory closes down, you're not trapped with property you can't sell. Suppose the husband has a job and is buying a house and there's a layoff. The value goes out of his house. But if he has a mobile home, he rents a trucking service and moves on and he hasn't lost anything. He may never have to do it, but the fact that he can is a comfort to him. How are they purchased? On time, just like an automobile. It's like paying rent. And then I discovered the greatest selling appeal of all, one that crawls through nearly all American life. Improvements are made on these mobile homes every year. If you are doing well, you turn yours in on a new model just as you do with an automobile if you can possibly afford to. There's status to that. And the turn-in value is higher than that of automobiles because there's a ready market for used homes. And after a few years, the once expensive home may have a poorer family. They are easy to maintain, need no paint since they are usually of aluminum, and they are not tied to fluctuating land values. How about schools? The school buses pick the children up right at the park and bring them back. The family car takes the head of the house to work and the family to a drive-in movie at night. It's a healthy life out in the country air. The payments, if even if high and festooned with interest, are no worse than renting an apartment and fighting the owner for heat. And where could you rent such a comfortable ground floor apartment with a place for your car outside the door? Where else could the kids have a dog? Nearly every mobile home has a dog, as Charlie discovered to his delight. Twice I was invited to dinner in a mobile home and several times watched a football game on television. A manager told me that one of the first considerations in his business was to find and buy a place where television reception is good. Since I did not require any facilities, sewer, water, or electricity, the price to me for stopping the night was $1. So one of the things that my students notice is that he goes on about these mobile homes and he interviews people for about four to five pages. So it definitely took an interest in him. And that's probably because he was moving about in his own turtle shell, Rosinante, and um, found that he kind of liked it. And so he took an interest in this kind of, you know, other kind of mobile living that was popping up all over the country. Uh, now, I was not around in 1960, 61 when he was doing this trip, but um, it seems that a lot of things were happening then. You were having your strip malls, you were having your big box stores, mobile homes were being built, at least according to Steinbeck and all of these things. But of course he hadn't traveled across country since like, the, I think it was 1920 or 1930. So um, this stuff might have been earlier. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on this, but he seems to think that around 1960, 61, a lot of these strip malls, box stores, mobile homes uh, were just starting to come into vogue. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? The interstate highway system made a huge, huge difference. And that was the Eisenhower administration. I think that was kind of the, it, it facilitated trucking, it facilitated moving. It really made a big difference, I think. Hmm. And, and, what, and, and what years was that, Steve? It, was, it began during the Eisenhower administration. The interstate system was initially built as a form of civil defense. The idea was that they could move these missiles around easily to protect us against the Soviet scourge. Uh, and that was sort of the raison d'etre of the interstate system when it was originally developed. Hmm. 
And, and what, again, you're going to have to help me out. What year was that? It would be uh, 50s during the Eisenhower okay. administration, 52 to 60. So all throughout the 50s. Yeah, that's sort of when it began. And, it, you know, it just sort of snowballed after that. All right, cool. Well, there you go. Any other thoughts on this? I had an experience driving cross country when we moved to Oregon in a car that did not have cruise control. So I had my foot on the gas pedal for 10 hours. <laughs> Talk about leg cramps. Did it have power steering? Oh, it did have power steering. Okay. It was a small car, but it was the, it was the accelerator for 10 hours at a stretch. It was a pretty, pretty painful. <laughs> Yep, I think Alan's got something. Hi, I, I was curious about your grandfather being a truck driver because today's trucks are like being in an RV with the beds and the, they have much, they have a lot of comforts now. What was it like for your grandfather back then? Like, where would he spend the night? Did they have the beds in the those uh, cabs like they do today? Well, I mean, I wonder what the difference today in your grandfather's day. I think must be huge in trucking. Yeah, I think when he first started, they didn't have the little cab in the back, but then the longer he did it, I mean, I guess he did it for like, I don't know, 30 something years. So I guess the longer he drove, um, they did have them. So in, in the beginning, I think there was just a lot of like staying at cheap truck stops on the interstate and stuff like that, that were attached to like diners and showers and stuff like that. I think the cab, even though it might have been small, probably made it nicer because he didn't. He he could just pull into one of the truck stops and, you know, have some privacy. And I know it seems like it's not privacy, but I think that the truck stops probably got very loud and the rooms very loud. Whereas if he was in his own trailer, at least he would have a semblance of privacy. So yeah, and it was Navajo, and it's funny because Navajo trucking. Every once in a while, I'll see a Navajo truck um, on the highway. Um, not often, but every once in a while. Yeah. But he liked it, and it was a definite subculture, just like Steinbeck talks about. Um, they had their own language. They all kind of had their own favorite truck stops across the country. You know, some of them had become friends with cooks or waitresses, you know, that they would see you know, on their way out and on the way back across the country. So they would stop at the same place to see the same people. So, you know, it kind of develops its own little subculture. Um, so he's going to go a little bit more into the mobile home that he's going to actually have kind of like a pseudo interview with a couple that lives in one. The first impression forced on me was that permanence is neither achieved nor desired by mobile people. They do not buy for the generations, but only until a new model they can afford comes out. The mobile units are by no means limited to the park communities. Hundreds of them will be found sitting beside a farmhouse. And this was explained to me. So this is pretty interesting too. There was a time when on the occasion of a son's marriage and the addition of a wife and later of children to the farm, it was customary to add a wing or at least a lean-to on the home place. Now, in many cases, a mobile unit takes the place of additional building. A farmer from whom I bought eggs and home smoked bacon told me of the advantages. Each family has a privacy it never had before. The old folks are not irritated by crying babies. The mother-in-law problem is abated because the new daughter has a privacy she never had and a place of her own in which to build the structure of a family. When they move away, and nearly all Americans move away or want to, they do not leave unused and therefore useless rooms. Relations between the generations are greatly improved. The son is a guest when he visits the parent's house, and the parents are guests in the son's house. Then there are the loners, and I have talked with them also. Driving along, you see high on a hill, a single mobile home placed to command a great view. Others nestle under trees fringing a river or a lake. These loners have rented a tiny piece of land from the owner, and they need only enough for the unit and the rite of passage to get to it. Sometimes the loner digs a well and a cesspool and plants a small garden. 
but others transport their water in 50 gallon oil drums. Enormous ingenuity is apparent with some of the loaners in placing the water supply higher than the unit and connecting it with plastic pipe so that a gravity flow is ensured. One of the dinners that I shared in a mobile home was cooked in an immaculate kitchen, walled in plastic tile with stainless steel sinks and ovens and stoves flushed with the wall. The fuel is butane or some other bottled gas which can be picked up anywhere. We ate in a dining alcove paneled in mahogany veneer and I've never had a better or a more comfortable dinner. I had brought a bottle of whiskey as my contribution and afterward we sat in deep comfortable chairs cushioned in foam rubber. This family liked the way they lived and wouldn't think of going back to the old way. The husband worked as a garage mechanic about four miles away and made good pay. Two children walked to the highway every morning and were picked up by a yellow school bus. Sipping a highball after dinner, hearing the rushing of water in the electric dishwasher in the kitchen, I brought up a question that had puzzled me. These were good, thoughtful, intelligent people. So I said, one of our most treasured feelings concerns roots growing up rooted in some soil or some community. How did they feel about raising their children without roots? Was it good or bad? Would they miss it or not? The father, a good looking fair skinned man with dark eyes answered me. How many people today have what you are talking about? What roots are there in an apartment 12 floors up? What roots are in a housing development of hundreds and thousands of small dwellings almost exactly alike? My father came from Italy, he said. He grew up in Tuscany, in a house where his family had lived for maybe a thousand years. That's roots for you. No running water, no toilet, and they cooked with charcoal or vine clippings. They had just two rooms, a kitchen and a bedroom where everybody slept, grandpa, father, and all the kids, no place to read, no place to be alone and never had had. Was that better? I bet if you gave my old man the choice, he'd cut his roots and live like this. He waved his hands at the comfortable room. But the fact is he did cut his roots and go away to America. And then he lived in a tenement in New York, just one room, walk up, cold water and no heat. That's where I was born, and I lived in the streets as a kid until my old man got a job upstate in New York in the great country. You see, he knew about vines. That's about all he knew. Now you take my wife. She's Irish descent. Her people had roots, too. In a peat bog, the wife said, and we lived on potatoes. She gazed fondly through the door at her fine kitchen. But don't you miss some kind of permanence? Who's got permanence? Factory closes down, you move on. Good times and things opening up, you move on where it's better. You got roots, you sit and starve. You take the pioneers in the history books. They were movers. Take up land, sell it, move on. I read in the book how Lincoln's family came to Illinois on a raft. They had some barrels of whiskey for a bank account. How many kids in America stay in the place where they were born if they can get out? So here's my question to you. How many of you were born and raised in Seattle? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Movers. <laughs> so it's interesting because I always ask that question when I, when I do this kind of book. And very rarely do I get anybody who is born and raised in the place where they are. Um, so that's very interesting to think about. So Steinbeck says, you've thought about this a lot. And the guy says, um, don't have to think about it. There it is. I've got a good trade. Long as there's automobiles, I can get work. But suppose the place I work goes broke. I got to move where there's a job. I get to my job in three minutes. You want I should drive 20 miles because I got roots? Later, they showed me magazines designed exclusively for mobile dwellers, stories and poems and hints for successful mobile living, how to stop a leak, 
how to choose a place for sun or coolness. And there were advertisements for gadgets, fascinating things for cooking, cleaning, washing clothes, furniture, and beds and cribs. Also, there were full page pictures of new models, each one grander and more shiny than the next. There's thousands of them, said the father, and there's going to be millions. Joe's quite a dreamer, the wife said. He's always figuring something out. Tell him your ideas, Joe. Well, maybe he wouldn't be interested. Sure, I would. Well, it's not a dream, like she said. It's for real, and I'm going to do it pretty soon now. I'm going to take a little capital, but it would pay off. I've been looking around the used lots for the unit I want at the price I want to pay. Going to rip out the guts and set it up for a repair shop. I got enough tools nearly already, and I'll stock little things like windshield wipers and fan belts and cylinder rings and inner tubes, stuff like that. You take these courts are getting bigger and bigger. Some of the mobile people get two cars. I'll rent me a hundred feet of ground right near and I'll be in business. There's one thing you can say about cars. There's nearly always something wrong with them that's got to be fixed. And I'll have my house, this here one right beside my shop. That way I would have a bell and give 24 hour service. Sounds like a good idea, I said, and it does. Best thing about it, Joe went on, if business fell off, why I just move on where it was good. His wife said, Joe's got it all worked out on paper where everything's going to go, every wrench and drill, even an electric welder. Joe's a wonderful welder. I said, I take back what I said, Joe. I guess you've got your roots in a grease pit. You could do worse. I even worked that out. And you know, when the kids grow up, we could even work our way south in the winter and north in the summer. Joe does good work, said his wife. He's got his own steady customers where he works. Some men come 50 miles to get Joe to work on their cars because he does good work. I'm a real good mechanic, said Joe. So, you know, in my classes, I say to my students, why do you think he put in that whole conversation? Because he had already written about three to three and a half pages on his own musings on mobile home people. But he puts it in there as, as kind of a real conversation with real people who are living in a mobile home to back up his musings on the subject with some kind of reality from people who already live like that. Um, and it's an interesting aside because he's seeing this kind of pop up all over the country and he wants to know why people are doing it because it's very different than the kind of living that he is used to, which is where people have roots in one place. Of course, he grew up on a ranch in California so he had a lot of roots in that specific place in the history of his family. Driving the big highway near Toledo, I had a conversation with Charlie. So we haven't heard from Charlie in a while. So now he's gonna bring Charlie back in. Um, I had a conversation with Charlie on the subject of roots. He listened, but he didn't reply. In the pattern thinking about roots, I and most other people have left two things out of consideration. Could it be that Americans are a restless people, a mobile people, never satisfied with where they are as a matter of selection? The pioneers, the immigrants who peopled the continent were the restless ones in Europe. The steady rooted ones stayed home and are still there. But every one of us, except the Negroes who were forced here as slaves, are descended from the restless ones, the wayward ones who were not content to stay at home. Wouldn't it be unusual if we had not inherited this tendency? And the fact is that we have, but that's the short view. What are roots and how long have we had them? If our species has existed for a couple of million years, what is its history? Our remote ancestors followed the game, moved with the food supply, and fled from evil weather, from ice and the changing seasons. Then after millennia beyond thinking, they domesticated some animals so that they lived with their food supply. Then of necessity, they followed the grass that fed their flocks in endless wanderings. Only when agriculture came into practice, and that's not very long ago in terms of the whole history, <clears throat> did a place achieve meaning and value and permanence. But land is a tangible, and tangibles have a way of getting into few hands. 
Thus it was that one man wanted ownership of land and at the same time wanted servitude because someone had to work it. Roots were an ownership of land and tangible and immovable possessions. In this view, we are a restless species with a very short history of roots and those not widely distributed. Perhaps we have overrated roots as a psychic need. Maybe the greater the urge, the deeper and more ancient is the need, the will, the hunger to be somewhere else. So I would be interested uh, at this point, if anybody wants to kind of give your thoughts on roots, did you, did you live in one place like your whole childhood? Did you live in one place as an adult? Um, or did you live nomadically? Um, anybody want to share their thoughts on whether they're a roots-based person or a nomadic kind of person? Or a mixture of the two, perhaps? You know, one of the things that I think he addresses is why people move. Uh, and there is this sort of noble sense that we're restless people, we're always looking for better things. But there are also people who move because of loss. And he addresses that with this mechanic who points out that he's happy where he is, but he could lose everything in a, in a minute. Uh, and so it, it isn't always a sort of wonderful idea of moving on for better things. It's sometimes escaping some situation where you would like to have stayed, but you can't. Mm -hmm. And like anybody who's visited certain towns in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, where factories close down and then the houses lose their value instantaneously. And then you're kind of stuck there because you can't even get out of your house which you've already put into it. Yeah, that's where I grew up. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so that's a reality. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I think Mary's trying to say something. Mary, you have to unmute yourself. Here we go. Um, it was clear that any jobs that afforded a, a good lifestyle were already occupied by people who were not going to leave them for a long time. And there were no jobs for young people. So you had to move. Hmm. You had to leave. And Mary, you, you grew up, was it Wisconsin or? Wisconsin, right. Wisconsin, yeah. In a rural area. And, and so you had, to move, you had to move to a more urban or, or populated area? Right. And my family didn't own an, a farm. So that was, you know, what most people had. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's like, there's need. Sometimes it can be to move to a place that you think would be nicer to inhabit, but other times it's, it's forced or by need. Yeah. And Charlie's not giving any answers. So, I mean, Steinbeck's got to figure this out on his own. So he says, um, Charlie had no answer to my premise. Also, he was a mess. Mm -hmm. I had promised myself to keep him combed and clipped and beautiful, and I hadn't done it. His fur was bald and dirty. Poodles do not shed any more than sheep do. At night, when I had planned this virtuous grooming, I was always too busy with something else. Also, I discovered a dangerous allergy I didn't know he had. One night I had pulled up at a trucker's park where huge cattle trucks put up and cleaned their beds. Around the park, there was a mountain of manure and a fog of flies. Although Rosinante was screened, the flies got in, in their millions and hid in corners and would not be dislodged. For the first time I got out the bug bomb and sprayed heavily, and Charlie broke into a sneezing attack so violent and prolonged that I had to finally carry him out in my arms. In the morning, the cab was full of sleepy flies, and I sprayed it, and Charlie had another attack. After that, whenever flying visitors invaded, I had to close Charlie out and air out the house or a cab after the pests were dead. I never saw such a severe allergy. Since I hadn't seen the Middle West for a long time, many impressions crowded in on me as I drove through Ohio and Michigan and Illinois. The first was the enormous increase in population. Villages had become towns and towns had grown to cities. 
The roads squirmed with traffic. The cities were so dense with people that all attention had to be devoted to not hitting anyone or not being hit. The next impression was of an electric energy, a force, almost a fluid of energy so powerful as to be stunning in its impact. No matter what the direction, whether for good or for bad, the vitality was everywhere. I don't think for a second that the people I had seen and talked to in New England were either unfriendly or discourteous, but they spoke tersely and usually waited for the newcomer to open communication. Almost on crossing the Ohio line, it seemed to me that people were more open and more outgoing. The waitress in a roadside stand said good morning before I had a chance to, discussed breakfast as though she liked the idea, spoke with enthusiasm about the weather, sometimes even offered some information about herself without my delving. That's very different from the place he went to in Maine where the, the guys just said yup or burped. Strangers talked freely to one another without caution. I had forgotten how rich and beautiful is the countryside, the deep topsoil, the wealth of great trees, the lake country of Michigan, handsome as a well-made woman and dressed in jewel. It seemed to me that the earth was generous and outgoing here in the heartland, and perhaps the people took a cue from it. And one of my purposes was to listen, to hear speech, accents, speech rhythms, overtones, and emphasis. For speech is so much more than, than mere words and sentences. I did listen everywhere. It seemed to me that regional speech is in the process of disappearing. It's not gone, but it's going. 40 years of radio and 20 years of television must have this impact. Communications must destroy localness by a slow, inevitable process. That's a very that's a very interesting thought, and we usually um, stop and I have my students write about that. But communications must destroy localness by a slow, inevitable process. Now, if you think of the kind of communications he's talking about, there's some radio shows, there's probably a handful of television stations compared to the communications global network that we have now. And so, has that destroyed localness even more? Uh, that's a question for you to ponder tonight. Um, but I'd be interested in your answers next week. I can remember a time when I could almost pinpoint a man's place of origin by his speech. That is growing more difficult now and will in some foreseeable future become impossible. It is a rare house or building that is not rigged with spiky combers of the air. Radio and television speech becomes standardized, perhaps better English than we have ever used. Just as our bread, mixed and baked, packaged and sold without benefit of accident or human frailty is uniformly good and uniformly tasteless, so will our speech become one speech. Uh, and that's actually um, about 20 years ago, um, a lot of people started writing about this and they called it Globish was the name of the English, G-L-O-B-I-S-H. Um, and sociologists and speech therapists uh, were already seeing that in the global vernacular, there was this globish kind of English that people were beginning to speak all over the world. And it didn't have as much to do with the accent as much as the kind of English that was being used as kind of short, stunted, unprecise, uh, I mean, very precise in what you're talking about, but using very little adjectives or adverbs just kind of this basic English to get by talking. And they said that the more that this globish English took over the world, um, the more that the English spoken English countries would also become less and less um, creative and um, descriptive and more and more just kind of basic and to the point, um, which is interesting because if you then look at texting, which, which I don't do, but um, when I look at my students' texts, there's almost no descriptions in it. Um, they barely ever use adjectives or adverbs or anything like that. They just use nouns and a lot of them just use pictures or like the emoji thing. 
And of course, that then takes away your ability many times to be descriptive in your speech and your writing. So Steinbeck, again, was, was talking about something that, that later on and, and, and now has become a huge issue with psychology, sociology, speech therapists, anthropology, stuff like that. He says, I who love words and the endless possibility of words am saddened by this inevitability. For with local accent will disappear local tempo. The idioms, the figures of speech that make language rich and full of the poetry of place and time must go. And in their place will be a national speech wrapped and packaged, standard and tasteless, which is what Globish is now for the world. Localness is not gone but it is going. In the many years since I have listened to the land, the change is very great. Traveling west along the northern routes, I did not hear a truly local speech until I reached Montana. That is one of the reasons I fell in love again with Montana. The West Coast went back to packaged English. Sorry, all you people at Washington, it just puts you, throws you to the curb. Um, the Southwest kept a grasp, but a slipping grasp on localness. Of course, the Deep South holds on by main strength to its regional expressions, just as it holds and treasures some other anachronisms. But no region can hold out for long against the highway, the high tension line, and the national television. What I am mourning is perhaps not worth saving, but I regret its loss. Nevertheless, and I think I'll end on that thought because then he goes into kind of a different tract. And I think that's a good place to end. So I'll read that last line again. He says, um, what I am mourning is perhaps not worth saving, but I regret its loss nevertheless. So any thoughts on this section that, that we read today? It's about roughly uh, 15 pages uh, long. Any, any thoughts on, on the different subjects that he speaks about here? There we go. Sorry, we got some in the room here. Well, I have a very interesting history because I I was born in Chicago, and then I went to the University of Iowa, and people told me, where are you from? You have an accent. Part A. Uh, but then I, my oldest nephew and his wife, both grew up in Southern California, moved to New York, and my two greats uh, both have a different language. And they now live, they now live in Austin. but. Uh, very interesting how our accents have followed us in the family. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Other thoughts? Any of these topics? Truckers, language, uh, disappearance of language, mobile homes, nomadic living versus roots based living? Well, mobile homes have, have moved to, into Seattle. As I drive around the city, I see many people living in um, RVs with mobile homes on the back. Um, there's even been an article about young people who can't afford the houses in Seattle uh, buying mobile homes as an alternative. Mm. So the trend is continuing, I guess. Mm -hmm. We yeah. Had we had a mobile home park in Mallard in which the guy was going to build a second story on it. And the neighbors and businesses around protested, so he took it down. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was um, just out of college and went to Europe, and I, I had grown up in Minnesota. And uh, I was introduced to people from the East Coast who seemed like they talked a different language. I didn't think I had an accent at all, <laughs> but they immediately detected <laughs> where 
where I was from. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting in the, in the I've taught a lot of different classes um, for this for your, your place there uh, in Green Lake. And it seems like you have an awful lot of people, at least in my, from Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Yeah. Um, it seems like usually two thirds of the people in any class that I'm in are from that area of the country. <laughs> Does that mean we're more friendly? <laughs> uh, I mean, you're, 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 you're all seem to be friendly, but it's interesting because when I lived in Florida, I did this work with a lot of, uh, mm -hmm residents of this type down there. And so many of the people in Florida were from Ohio and Michigan and Illinois. Um, so I think that part of the country tends to move a lot. <laughs> you know, in, in Florida, the west coast of Florida is peopled by people from the Midwest and the east coast of Florida is peopled by folks from the east coast. Right. So if, if you go to Naples, someplace like that, you're going to run into people from the Midwest. But if you go to uh, the, you know, the East Coast is going to be New Yorkers, New Jersey people. They sort of go directly south. <laughs> Just cut it down. Yeah. Yep, one more, one more comment. There you go. I, I was interested in your observation on slang because through the generations, there's been different slang words. And the one I remember that maybe we still use or some people is the word cool. But we had slang words growing up, and now, and, and each generation seems to have their own slang words. And there's one that came out not long ago, and every other word was like, mm -hmm. uh, like, and I just like. And, wow. and now we're hearing no worries, no, not pardon me, or just it's no worries. And you're kind of inclined to say, well, I'm not worried about this, but I, you know, what? What are your, do you have comments on slang? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it's interesting because the, the like phenomena actually came from a movie called Valley Girl, which was based on slang speech patterns from the Simi Valley in California. And it was like Nicolas Cage's first real movie where it became popular. But anyway, it was all these Valley Girls in California and every other word they'd say like. That went across the country. In, in, through people going to the movies. And I remember my sister was three years older than me and she started to say like after every word and it drove my parents nuts. <laughs> and they would be like, if you say like again, like you're not going outside for the next week. And she'd be like, well, like, like, and they're like, that's it. You're in your room for the next week. Cause they just like, you can't talk like that, you know? <laughs> So the, the word like was uh, in my house, at least my sister became a valley girl for about a month and then she learned <laughs> to not say it if she wanted to see the fresh air anymore. So, <laughs> but I, I gather every generation um, has their slang, um, but a lot of it comes out of, uh, comes out of movies and makes its way um, across the country. So you'll have people in New Jersey and Mississippi talking like Valley girls in California and their parents thinking they went absolutely insane. So, yeah. Uh, so good, good. Uh, so we're, we're now on page 80. Um, we're making our way. Um, will be probably after the next class, right around the halfway point uh, of the book, so. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you, we'll next, see you week. next week. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.